name's Ian Davis. I work in the Department of Education. I'd just like to say a few words to introduce Estelle. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Estelle Morris, Baroness Mo Morris of Yardley, member of the House of Lords. Estelle was member of Parliament for Birmingham Yardley from 92 to 2005. Was a member of the Cabinet as Education Secretary, as well as later serving as Minister for the Arts. Estelle was a PE and Humanities teacher at the inner city Sydney Stringer School in Coventry from 74 to 92, becoming head of sixth form studies. Glowing comments have been made about her work in what has been described as difficult school environments. Estelle made a considerable impact as a politician. After the 97 general election, Estelle was appointed Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for School Standards in the new Labour government. A year later, she became Minister of State for School Standards, and after the 2001 general election, joined the Cabinet as Secretary of State for Education and Skills. During this time, Estelle was widely credited for boosting standards in primary and secondary schools. The status of the profession was enhanced <coughs> as a result of her work. There was a thinking approach, consideration for others, and deep integrity about her work. She can speak with teachers and speaks for them. She is widely respected. In what I think of as the best diary account of recent Labour governments, she is described as, quote, modest, unassuming, down to earth, and knows education inside out. Another diarist, from a very different point in the political spectrum, <laughs> includes a description of her as, quote, a real star. She holds honorary doctorates from several universities. She continues to contribute significantly to public life, with, for example, her work as chair of the National Coal Mining Museum and the Hot Courses Foundation. The latter funds education of African HIV AIDS children and orphans. She writes a monthly column for Guardian Education. She has a very strong involvement with the University of York, for example, chairing the Department of Education Advisory Board. She's worked with us very supportively and to great effect. Estelle, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us today. We very much look forward to your contribution. Thank you very much, Uh, thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. That's a, a kind introduction. And thank you for asking me to contribute um, to this series of lectures. Um, ju just a few. I, I made. I gave the title months ago. It's one of those occasions when they wanted the title because of all this publicity I had to give to get anyone here. So I gave it absolutely months ago, and then I wrote the speech, and then I checked what the title was. <laughs> so I should have just checked the title before I wrote the speech. So it's sort of. Um, let me put the title on the board. Right, that's, that's the title that I gave, so that's the title I will endeavour to um, give my speech towards. But in truth, what I want to do, I want to look at that connection between education and politics. And partly because that's, uh, for you gather from my introduction, how I've spent the whole of my working life. And I'm quite intrigued by the relationship between them. And secondly, I think politically at the moment, we're at that time when Certainly, people say to me, there's no difference between the two, or you can't tell one from the other. Or in my case, saying to me, why don't the Labour Party come out and oppose what Michael Gove's doing, or whatever? And it's made me think a lot about why there is that sort of, if, if that's true, whether the politicians are all saying the same things, and if so, what's happened to bring that about? Because it didn't used to be like that, and whether anything needs to be done about it. So essentially, it's sort of a 30, 35 minutes think through that relationship between politics and education over time. And I'm not sure I draw any real conclusions. I draw some conclusions, but I just want to reserve the right to change my mind about them next week. <laughs> you know, that, you know that, 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 that part you can be, that stage you can be at in your own thinking, when you think that's what you've concluded, but I just want some, you know, a bit of feedback from you, some ideas, and I might reserve uh, the right to change my mind. But 63, I was just thinking, I don't know how many of you thought it when Judith gave the date. I was first year secondary school in October 1963. And I think a quick work out was probably Alec Douglas Hume was Prime Minister and leader of the Conservative Party, and Harold Wilson was just about to be the Prime Minister, uh, leader of the Labour Party at the time. I think Joe Grimmond might have been leader 
of the Liberal Democrats. But if you think of the 50 years since then, all that's changed in education and all that's changed in politics, but I suppose the point is that they've changed at the same time. So the changes in politics have gone alongside the changes in education. And I think my sort of overriding theme is that the one influences the other. Is that sort of okay? So that's what I'm going to do. But I'm going to begin by giving you a bit of a test. All right? So it's a bit of, uh, you know, all good teachers are meant to sort of involve their class. So I'm not going to embarrass you by picking you out if you don't put your hand up. But just a bit of thinking. What I did, I looked at the party manifestos. And this isn't, you know, randomised controlled trial or anything like this. I, I picked out haphazardly some manifestos. And I think I've looked at 45, 64 because of its proximity to the start of the university, 79 because that was the start of Thatcherism, 97 because that was the start of um, New Labour, and 2010 because it was the most recent. And I've just got six, what I call vision, just, just some vision statements. And I'm just going to go through them. They're about education. And you've got to put your hand up. You've got to tell me whether they're Labour, you've got to tell me whether they're Conservative. <laughs> Is that all right? Now, the first one's the easiest. Give you t 10 seconds to read it. Conservative, put your hand up. Labour, put your hand up. OK. Labour, put your hand up. Conservative, I don't know who's won that one. That one? Conservative? Oh, that's, the big, that's the biggest majority, that. Labour? This is my favourite. Labour? Conservative? Labour? Conservative? And it's the last one, I think. Conservative? Labour? Okay, let's look at the answers. Right, so you know that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna embarrass you. First now I thought that was the easiest, merely because of the word nationalised industry and bureaucratic machine. It was the one bit of politics that came through. But that was the 45 Conservative Party manifesto. That was the 45 Labour Party manifesto. The New Labour, Labour Party Manifesto 97. This was the most surprising one for me. I thought it was beautiful prose that I would have been proud to own as a Labour politician. <laughs> and it's the damn 97 Conservative Party Manifesto. Um, I, I really, yeah, I'm sure I've heard Labour politicians say that. <laughs> I didn't know they'd pinched it from the Tories. Interesting, because they talk about equality. That's far more mechanistic, and yet it's Labour Party manifesto. So there they are. Now, the point, the only reason I've done that is partly to make sure you've not fallen asleep in the first five minutes. But, es but essentially, you've not really been able to tell the difference between the two. That's the point. And these are vision statements. And they're the manifesto. It's what you voted on. Every one of you has voted from 45 to, to, to onwards. No one's old enough to vote from 45. But any of those elections between 45 and onwards. That's what you voted for. And the truth is, there's a lot of similarities between them. And you'll actually, you know, you'll notice there's gone the right through. So maybe we've made it up. Maybe there's never been that difference between the parties. If you look at their statement, there's not. But what now to just show you a, a different set? You're going to find this much, much easier. All right? Because these are also from the manifestos. But it's just... You shout this one out. <laughs> Conservative? Yes? <coughs> Labour? Labour? 
Conservative? We're still waiting. <laughs> Labour, yeah? That should be restored. It's copied wrong. Don't. Yeah? I put that on because of the For the Handicapped at the end. I love that, 1979. I think that must have been, I thought that was an interesting oddity. I think it's because there are independent special schools and the language of the time wasn't disability but handicap. Right, now look, they're from the same manifestos, but none of you had any difference at all in actually working out one from the other. So what I sort of concluded from that, in terms of the vision stuff, there's not, not much difference. But, you know, I looked through all the manifestos quite carefully and I've not deliberately chosen the policies that are about grammar schools and private schools. That was all there was. That was all there was. There weren't policies about anything else. So when I thought, right, I'll now go look at some of the policies, they just fell out at me. The pick bits I could pick out were about grammar schools or they were about selection or about, in, about independent school. And look at the dates I had to go for as well. 45, 50, 64, 79, and, and, seven, and uh, 70, 79, 2 and 79. And sort of what you learn about politics of that era was the political arguments were all about structural change. It was how you change who goes into which school. And I think the second point was that it played to the values of the political parties at the time. They're very closely connected. So, you know, that notion of the bureaucratic state, the socialists, um, doctrinaire socialist attacks, I think that's as much about politics as about education. It's using the word socialist as a term of abuse. It's not actually acknowledging it as a different political... It's, it's almost a term, a term of uh, abuse. And represents a major obstacle to equality of opportunity. That's in the Labour Party 1 of 79. It just lies very naturally with what the parties set themselves up to do. And that was the main difference in the parties. If you look at the manifestos of those times, those were the two education policies. And that's clearly because at that time, people felt that that was all the change that was needed to actually bring about the vision of society they wanted. But what you realise is those sort of stop at 1979, when we got rid of quite a lot of grammar schools, got quite a lot of comprehensive schools, standards had certainly risen, but you'd certainly not got all the changes and all the improvements that you might have wanted. So I reckon it's strange in that there's no difference, and that's what I think that's why people say there used to be a real difference between the parties. That's why they say, because th it was as clear as anything, if you're Labour, you're for comprehensive, if you're Tory, you're actually for grammar schools. But it wasn't very broad and it wasn't very sophisticated, but it was clear, it was red and blue, and the dividing lines, as the politicians would like to say, were absolutely drawn clear between the two. I want to now look at a different set of policies taken from later manifestos, We'll just have a look at those together. The Conservative, we shall promote higher standards of achievement in basic skills, 79. We propose to assess every child at 5, 97. To improve standards in future, our new teacher training curriculum will stress traditional teaching methods, including whole class teaching and learning to read by the sound of the letters. We will, 97, we will promote the teaching of systematic synthetic phonics, I'd like to think every Tory candidate knew what systematic <laughs> synthetic phonics are like. And I don't even think the leader would do it. Let's see, of that similar era, of that same area, let's see what Labour was saying. That means set, and obviously that's half a sentence, that means setting children in classes to maximise progress. Every school needs baseline assessment of pupils when they enter school, 97. We will encourage the use of the most effective teaching methods, including phonics for reading and whole class interactive, interactive teaching for maths, 97, with a three hours guarantee, again half a sentence, of one-to-one -one and small group tuition for every child falling behind 2010. Now, there's two things that are interesting, a number of things. It's a really interesting list. Firstly, 
I probably could interchange them and it wouldn't make a difference. And you can almost match them off. We propose to assess every child at five. Every child needs baseline assessment. Um, I suppose you might say traditional teaching methods, although the bit about phonics, um, our class interactive teaching doesn't say traditional teaching methods, you can see they sort of come under the same area. I, I couldn't exactly interchange them, but I could almost interchange them. But there's a bigger change than that, isn't there? Because what the policies are about is teaching and learning. And again, I didn't cherry pick these. It's what there was in the manifestos. It's all there was. I, I mean, the stuff I've left out is like, we will rebuild buildings and things like that. We will work with parents. That's the bit I've left out. But this fell out naturally. And they are fundamentally different to the set of education policies in the earlier part of the post-war period. And they are about how to teach. And of course, this is alongside the time of the National Curriculum Inspection about what to teach. So where politics had actually moved from, the politicians had moved themselves from genuinely believing that the thing that would make the difference was grammar schools or comprehensive to understanding that although that had brought about progress, it hadn't solved all problems, to concluding, to moving on, wow, what really makes the difference is not who you admit to each school, but what you do with the children once they're in school. And so, in the absence of anyone else doing it, they occupied the ground about policies of teaching and learning. And that's, we've had consequences about that ever on. So that was sort of um, where they got. I, if you think about it, I think this is the beginning of people saying they're all the same. Because they are interchangeable. But if you draw a line, the thing that people thought that they were, now they were the same. Because don't forget, the first set of slides, you couldn't tell any difference between them. So there's always been a bit of sameness. But the biggest gap, the biggest difference at this point, is actually the difference from, if you like, the policies that will bring about change, the levers for change between the two parties have moved from being totally different with clear dividing lines into being not very different without clear dividing lines. Right, I thought I'd gone to one too far. So that, that's right. And I think that what's happened at that point is that it's brought the political parties onto the similar grounds, and I think they've been there ever since. And I just wanted to explore why that's been the case, because it's not just that they've decided to pull different levers and use different levers of powers. And I sort of put forward three reasons why in this latter period, really, 79, 80s, into the 80s, into the 90s, into the 21st century, I think three things happened that pushed them onto the same ground. Firstly, the changes in society influenced the politicians' view. Let me give you one example, or two examples, one from each party of that. I think, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not being a party politician tonight, but I don't think it's out of order to say, I suspect the post-war Tories weren't lose, having sleepless nights over how to close the social class gap. I don't think in 45 you went into the Conservative Party to find out how to close the social class gap. I think you went into the Labour Party to find out how to close the social class gap. But I genuinely believe that if you're a Tory now, you worry about the social class gap. And you worry about it because you see, that you worry about it for two reasons. One, the economy's changed, and we will only survive and thrive as a nation if we get all children achieving at a higher level, which we've not had to do until the last 20 years. And secondly, we see the social consequences on the fabric of society of not closing the social class gap in terms of who ends up in youth offender institutes, who ends up in prison, who ends up with poor health, who ends up long-term unemployed, who is more likely to end up with broken marriage, and whose children are likely to be the nuisances that exist in most communities and neighbourhoods in our country. So whatever your politics, whatever your politics, if you're a right-wing politician, right of centre, closing the social class gap, equality is not your natural home. 
but the changes in society have pushed you to have to embrace it as a desirable thing to achieve. And if you're a Labour Party politician, left of the centre, I don't think you joined the Labour Party in 1945 to meet the needs of the aspirant middle class. I don't think that's what you joined the Labour Party for. I think in 45, if you were bothered about what's happening to the middle class, you joined the Tory Party. But by the time you've got to 2010, you do worry about the middle class, partly because they are the people that you helped in your labour when you were in power in the 60s. And you have policies to help them get to middle class, and they stop voting for you. And, you know, and there's, you know, more people are middle class. No party will ever get elected again in this country on the votes of the working class. And also, the patterns of voting have broken down in this country. You've got to need middle class people to vote for left of centre policies if the left of centre parties are ever going to get in power again. And more of the Labour Party people are middle class than used to be the case in 45. And so just those changes, that's reality. People have ended up in the political parties coming together. So I genuinely believe, whatever you think about Michael Gove, I genuinely believe he wants to close the social class gap. Whatever you believe about Labour, we, we genuinely try to develop policies that will help children of middle class and upper class people as well. The second thing that's happened that is closely connected is the political belief that you can only win from the centre ground. Now, I don't know whether that's true. I think it's been true for 20 years. I think people are getting fed up of the centre ground. You know, one joke is, you know, in the centre ground too long, you get run over by people coming over you. And I think, you know, it's sort of might be where they are. But its consequences for education have been really real. Again, I'd just give two examples. In the centre ground, what it's meant is that Labour Party doesn't talk about abolishing independent schools any longer. That trust we were about to set up in 1964 must still be working somewhere, because I never saw a report from it. And it's a long time since the Labour Party has had in its manifesto that it will abolish the independent schools. It's not even had in its manifesto since 97 that it will abolish grammar schools, let alone independent schools. And that's because, well, it's come back in a minute, but if you look at the Tories, this year, since 97, they have not had in their manifesto that they will reintroduce selection. John Major was the last Tory to say a grammar school in every town. But if you look at that, I will put money on be my being able to find you, with not much effort, a whole bunch of Labour Party people who want to abolish independent schools. And I'll not be able to find you many Labour Party members who don't want to abolish grammar schools. And I know I can find you lots of Tories who would like to bring back selection. Some, one actually said to me once, the great thing about academies is they're just like grammar schools. I think they misunderstood academies. But it was just that giveaway. But they don't, it's not in their manifestos. It's in their heart. It's in their DNA. But it's not in their manifestos because it's not centre ground. And so what this understanding that you've got to be in the centre ground as men is that the policies that defined one from the other the policies that made them easily told apart, you don't hear about. And that makes people fed up. You say, you don't even want to abolish grammar schools any longer. Or if you're a Tory, you say, you know, you've even given up arguing that we should have grammar schools back, and yet they're real things. And the third one is, which I, given the work that you know, we do here at York now, and I found most interesting, and I didn't realise this until after I'd stopped being a politician, and, which is more to the pity, but of course what's happened if you just look at these things again, if I took away Conservative and Labour and took away the we, sort of the ownership, they almost stand as educational policies, not political policies. Just glance at them. I'm not sure they are political policies. I think they are education policies. And what's happened over that same period of time is that education policies have become political policies. And the best example I can give you that is one at my own expense, which is the literacy and numeracy strategies in 97. 
And just a bit of background, they were actually, no politician drew up, drew up the literacy strategy because it's, it's actually full of education. It was drawn up and uh, Michael Barber and um, David Reynolds did the maths strategy. Academics, worked with a team of academics, travelled the work, gathered the evidence, produced the report and published it. Now a really important thing happened at that time. That was a solid piece of education work. I think we were told about it, because um, I was in the shadow team at the time, we were told it's happening, but never once did we actually have anything to do with it. It was using a language that wasn't politics. It was using a language that wasn't to do with us. It wasn't, wasn't where our foot was. But what we went into the, what Labour went into the late uh, 97 election, what election with, election with was a pledge that every school would do an hour of literacy a day and an hour of numeracy a day, and we set a target that 80% of children at level uh, would achieve level four by the end of key stage two. We converted the educational policy into a political policy. So we, we ground it down to a easily bit of communicable information. And it was a brilliant political policy. Every child will spend an hour a day learning tried and trusted methods about how to read. And every child will have an hour of day of doing mental arithmetic and all that. And we converted it, because that's what, we, it's what we're good at. We converted that into something we could talk to the public about. We used the educational document for a completely different purpose. Now, maybe it doesn't matter. Let me say the good and the bad about that. Just to spend judgment about what you think of the strategies. The only way, don't you, those of you who are academics, don't you dream of your research getting national coverage? Don't you dream of you producing some research that actually gets put into every school in the land? Well, you won't do that, but politicians can. So the good thing was, it was a good piece of research, and we did our bit by putting it into every school in the country. And it's quite unique, that, because that rarely happens. The bad bit was the teachers saw it as a political policy, not an education policy. And because they saw it as a political policy, they resisted it and resented it, rather than welcoming it and using it to their own good. So those are the changes, I think, that have sort of taken place. Right, so what does that lead you to conclude? Go back to my original, uh, original question, um, which was a few slides back, has there been more continuity than change? Look, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a tribal politician, always have been, always will be. And I know the difference between the political parties. I can sense it, I can smell it, I can feel it. If I'm in a, there's just going to be a tribal politician, I have a bunch of room, a bunch of Tories, their language is different than mine. And those deep-seated, I think, still class-rooted um, differences still exist. But what I also understand, that for people who aren't tribal politicians like me, and I'm a diminishing group, that that's not particularly clear. And I think, in some ways, the answer to the question, the answer to the question is the more similarities are change, is it's both, it's all lot. Sometimes the political parties um, are, have continu continuation things, there are similarities, so let me just think of some ideas. Ofsted, Labour didn't abolish Ofsted, was never going to abolish Ofsted, never said it would abolish Ofsted, but the teaching profession thought it was going to abolish Ofsted. So there's been that continuity of Ofsted and inspection that's gone through three governments now, from Tory to Labour and back to Tory again. Tuition fees, whatever the argument was when Labour introduced, when Tories introduced tuition fees to begin with, Labour's continuing them and the Tories have increased them again. Parental choice, whatever warnings there's been, that line of parental choice has actually gone through, has been the whole thing about accountability mechanism. And there are some real differences. There are some points when there have been absolutely different things happening with the parties. Vocational qualifications. Labour spent a lot of its years between 97 and 2010 building up vocational qualifications 
and giving them equivalence to GCSEs and recognising that in the, accountability, in, the, in the performance tables. What's happened now? Michael Gove's absolutely got rid of them, don't think he ever makes a speech on them, and they certainly can't be equivalent to anything. In fact, they don't appear in their own right in the performance tables, let alone as equivalent to GCSE. The assisted places scheme, the nursery voucher scheme, there's never any doubt about that. There's a really interesting argument now about qualified teacher status. And I think the dividing lines between the two are absolutely right. So sometimes there's very different and there's big change. And sometimes, which is the most annoying thing for people, they say they're changing things, but they relaunch them with a different name. So that's the terrible political trick. So um, Holiday Learning Clubs, I listened to a, an article, I listened to something from, uh, the, um, I think it was a Lib Dem announcement, they had a great idea. They were going to provide some money for children who had fallen behind in reading and, num and literacy and numeracy at the end of primary school to have summer classes to catch up. And we did that in 97. It was just called something different. And the whole of volunteering has been relaunched by the political parties. A silly one, the school games. I don't know if you know, but school games, as in sport, was introduced last year. I know the person who did it. It's the games that used to go on under a different name, renamed as school games. And the whole of mentor. So the answer to the question, is the continuity or is the change, is yes, no, and sometimes there's change and it's called a different name. But since you're an academic bunch, I felt obliged to come to a sort of different conclusion than that. So this is what I want to sort of the last 10 minutes of what I wanted to say. Look, I've been, a, a lot of this has been, I, you know, I've not exaggerated and I've not made any of this up and I've not been over picky. I really have not been over picky, but I've, I've by the nature had to simplify the argument to uh, simplify the argument to make the point. But I think where I conclude, where I conclude that bit on that, that if politicians are going to have policies about teaching and learning, they should be the same. Because they shouldn't be based on political beliefs, they should be based on educational evidence. And that's the problem that we're in at the moment. We've got education masquerading as politics and what people expect when you give them a political idea is a clear difference between the political ideas of one party and the political ideas of another party. And as long as politicians operate in this area, in what I call pedag pedagogy, ah, I use the word pedagogy, um, in, in teaching and learning, they will, look, they will look the same. So let's just leave that to one side. Because what the reason I can, I know there's a difference, the reason you know, that I'm really confident to stand there and say there's a difference is there's a whole lot of things where there's a genuine difference between the two parties. And I just wanted to look. I've got five areas where I think there's a genuine difference between the parties, where there's not continuity. One is around the role of the state. And ideas I thought of in this to throw out is the role of local authorities and what they do. There's a difference of opinion between the parties on that. There's this notion of a middle layer, whether you need something between the government and schools. The whole of that middle layer, um, the Tories would call bureaucracy and Labour would call a middle layer. Labour would call an enabling layer and the Tories would call bureaucracy. There's the whole thing about admissions, which is the role of the state. Do you manage school admissions? to bring about greater equality of opportunity than we have at the moment? Or do, they, do you actually say, no, let, let the schools do it themselves, or let parents you know, do whatever they want to get the child in? There's a notion of a national curriculum, which is really interesting at the moment, because Michael Gove, the Tories, although they introduced it, they're whittling away now at the national curriculum. And there's a whole issue of faith schools as to whether we should, as a nation, be allowed faith schools. And all those are big issues of which there's a genuine difference of opinion amongst the political parties. The second area where I think there's a genuine difference of opinion is on the role of the market in education. 
I just get a few ideas I thought of that would come into this. Whether we should plan school places. I mean, we, know, we don't now plan the provision of school places. My favourite story, I did some work in Liverpool last year. Next September in Liverpool, there's 2,000 extra secondary school places being put into the system that's already got surplus places through new university technology colleges, new free schools, independent schools coming into the state sector as academies. And that's it. And, the, and the, Yeah, and that's it. So what's happening at the moment is nobody saying how many place, school places does Liverpool need. We've now got enough. Don't build any more. What's happening with that is that the poor schools that no one wants will close and the schools that people do want will flourish. So there's a big choice. Labour wouldn't do that. They would plan places. And the difference they've said on free schools is that it's a very complicated policy and it's not the best example to give. But the one difference they have brought out is you can't open in a, somewhere where there's already surplus places. But there's other things like for profit schools. I think at the next election, it's got to be a real issue because I think the Tories are going to say they're going to have for profit academies and for profit free schools. And I know the left wouldn't. Then this whole thing of whose schools are accountable to. Are they accountable to the pressures of the market? Or are they accountable to their local community? And what does locally, democratically elected um, representatives have to do with that? The third area, I think there's a real difference, is corporate competition and cooperation. And the examples I chose of that, the, the language, and both parties have done this, but Michael Gove's taken it to a bit of a new level with independent schools. And it's the difference between whether a school the most important thing about a school is its right to determine its own future and the right to make its own decisions, or whether you actually say there's something called cooperation and interdependence and where you acknowledge that the freedoms of the school have to be curtailed depending on the impact its decisions have on neighbouring schools. So it's, that, it's a really big political issue. It's a really clear dividing line. Just stop some schools doing things because of its detrimental effect on the others. Or do you say, no, let them, grow, let them get to be good schools and let them be the beacon of excellence that we need. The next one was finance, which I'll not say a lot about. The Liberal Democrats who've done the pupil premium, which is a wonderful initiative, a wonderful initiative, and making a real, real difference to many schools in really troubled circumstances have let the Tories off on the finance, but my basic thing, at the, I think my basic belief is there will always be a wish by the left to spend more, and there will always be a wish, wish by the right to spend less, even if we weren't in times of, of austerity. And the last one that I put up, and I found this one, I knocked this off at one point, but I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely clear about, I'm not entirely clear I'm right about this, but tell you what it was, it was this notion of and I think it might be because Michael Gove's the best example of it. But I'm, so it's true of Michael Gove. I'm not entirely true. It's, it's clear it's true of the whole Conservatives. But the left of centre are much more at ease with modernity. So they don't get upset about media studies. They don't get upset about equivalence of vocational studies. They don't get upset about the creative curriculum. They don't have a wish to go back to linear learning in history. They definitely don't believe that things used to be better in the past than they are now. And they don't go back to that golden era of when things were better. And modernity might be a better word than innovation. But I think the left of centre politician naturally yearns for change, whereas the right of centre politician naturally yearns for something that is the same, something that was good that you want to keep with you. And I think that those things are real differences between politics. Of course, what you notice is those things are not about education. I gave you educational examples, but I could be giving a speech on housing that looked, and I could talk about the role of the state, market, competition, corporate finance, innovation. I could do the same. They are political themes. So go back to my grammar school. Um, independent school things. P 
politicians are politicians that we understand of it when they root their ideas back to their philosophy. And so the conclusions that I actually drew about this and the problem that we've got at the moment is that politicians are publicly arguing about things about which they fundamentally agree. That's the problem. So I heard, I'm not exaggerating on this, I was listening to Today in Parliament on Monday, um, trying to get to sleep, and it was education questions. And the question that Tristram Hunt asked Michael Gove led to an exchange where what they were arguing about was which of the two political parties were most likely to make children read Jane Austen. <laughs> that was the question. Because the question from Tristram Hunt was, does the Secretary of State realise that his changes to the national curriculum will mean that fewer children read Jane Austen? Labour will make sure that children read Jane Austen. <laughs> Michael Gove came back and says, that is absolutely not right. We've got policies that mean children read Jane Austen. And you know what the truth is? Two clever, highly intelligent, academic men both want the children to read Jane Austen. There's no difference between the political parties on the canon of literature. We might have a really nice discussion about who's in the canon of literature and not, but it's actually not to do with our politics. So at the moment, there's a competition who could... I'll tell, you, I'll tell you exactly how that synthetic phonics got in the... I'm, I'm guessing. But I think I can tell you exactly how that synthetic phonics got into the 2010 election manifesto. Labour had been doing phonics since 97. And we've made progress, but not as much as the nation has a right to expect because any child not being able to read by 11 is a cause for concern. So what the Tories... Ha what we'd have done... It, this is, again, it's not a criticism. We'd have done the same. What they had to do was ratchet it up. They couldn't put in the manifesto, we're going to do phonics, we'd done it. They heard about the Ruth Miskin synthetic phonics. We'll have that, we'll put the synthetic phonics. So it ratcheted it up all the time. The setting that we put in, why did we put the setting in? We ratcheting up what they'd already done. And as long as politicians stay in the teaching learning space, they'll actually get it wrong because they'll compete about something which they shouldn't compete about. Now, the answer to that is they shouldn't have policies about teaching and learning. They should leave that to people in the universities and the think tanks and those who can do that politics-free. All that pedagogy thing should be politics-free. But the irony is that the things that they've genuinely got a difference of opinion about, they're not talking about. And if they could move so that they talked about these role of the state, the market, competition, corporation, finance, what they want for innovation, I think the dividing lines between them would begin to emerge again. So my conclusion ended up being there's huge differences between the political parties, but they're not talking about them. There's huge similarities, which they are talking about, but they're pretending that they've got different views on. One of the reasons they do that is because talking about who reads Jane Austen is much more attuned to parents and the public than talking about the effect of market on secondary school reorganisation. That's part of the issue there. And I think, therefore, my final conclusion, if I uh, stop uh, in and do a few questions and answers, was that if we re redrew the dividing line between education and politics, and force the politicians back into the bit where they're best and just get them to support the education and leave that to education evidence, I think we'd have a better education system. And I think more than that, from my point of view as a politician, is that I think it would be clearer for the public and it would restore their understanding of what the politician's role is in this great joint enterprise of delivering more for school children. Thank you very much indeed.